Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 370, taxes and real estate. Can multiple rental property losses be written off against other properties or income? What are the pros and cons of putting an investment property in an LLC? How do you get the best tax breaks on rental real estate? And how does real estate depreciation work? What do you need to think about when you're turning your house, your primary residence, into a rental property? Is a home equity line of credit, or HECM, or reverse mortgage, a good idea? The fellows also discuss a complicated property inheritance, and then, for something completely different, how much is enough to self-fund long-term care insurance? I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson CFP and Big Al Clopine CPA. Hey, Al, a question here from your uh, real estate webinar. It's like, if you own multiple rental properties and you have a significant loss on one property, can the loss be written off against income from the other properties or other income? The answer is yes on that. Uh, there's there's two kinds of losses that you could have potentially on a, on a real rental property. One is just the ongoing losses from your rental property. In other words, your rental income minus your expenses minus depreciation creates a loss and maybe a significant loss. That's considered a passive loss. That passive loss can be used against any other property that has income. So the answer is yes, you can net those two together. The other way you can have a significant loss is if you sell a property at a loss, a little bit hard nowadays because properties have gone up so much in general, but let's just say you had a loss on a property, you get to take all of that loss and you can use that against other passive income uh, and, and, and it's fully available uh, actually against other income as well. I've oversimplified it because there's if you group the properties, it's, there's different rules and just be aware of that. But in general, yes, anytime you have a loss on a rental property, you can use that loss against other income from rental properties. Okay, we got a um, right in from Captain K uh, from Indy. Dear YMYW, thank you for your webinar on alternative retirement income in real estate, February 22. Um, I'm thinking of buying in investment oceanfront condo in Florida in having my renters help me pay the mortgage. I plan on putting 20% down on the condo loan. My cash on cash will be about 12.3%. What are the pros and cons of putting the condo in an LLC? What are the best ways to get tax breaks and how does the depreciation of real estate work on your income and taxes? I'll give you the numbers below to see if I can stay in that 12% tax bracket. I'm 67, yo retired physician, drive a 2017 Chevy Cruze of a Basset Hound for pets for over 35 years. He's had a Basset Hound for 35 years? That's a Pro Well, probably more than one, I'm guessing. Coors Light is my drink of choice. Boom, Captain K. Um, I'm happily married, and yes, she's a smoking hot. All right, good for you, buddy. It Age 69, I plan on living on $100,000 per year, $83,000 from Social Security and fixed income, and $17,000 from my brokerage account. My accountant told me about YMYW several years ago. Oh, the accountant. How about that, huh? <laughs> thank you, Joe and Big Al, for the spitball. And P.S. Andy, thank you for keeping Joe and Al in check. Okay. So let's um, first, so he wants to buy a condo. Sure. A, a oceanfront condo right um, in, in florida in, in florida and wants to pay half a million dollars for it sure it's going to put 20 percent down and he thinks he's going to get 12.3 percent cash on cash okay okay um, got it. his first question what are the pros and cons of putting the condo in an llc so the pro is simply that if that condo is in the llc and something goes horribly wrong with that condo then the damages are generally limited to the equity in that condo to have whoever is suing you instead of all your personal assets. Now, again, we're not attorneys and there's probably ways to get around this if you were like grossly negligent, I would think, but that's why you do an LLC is to limit your exposure to uh, something goes horribly wrong on your property. Someone falls off a balcony and dies. That would be an example of that. And that's your fault. Are your personal assets at risk? Maybe depending upon what you did or didn't do with securing that balcony, or maybe the screws were loose, <laughs> right? I don't know. That's why you do an LLC. Uh, the cons are 
you got to set up an LLC. And generally you hire an attorney. It costs you 1500 bucks or, or more to do this. And depending upon the state you're in, you may have annual filing. California, you have to file. California, you have to pay $800 per year. Florida, I'm sure is a lot more pro-friendly on, on that. So maybe it's not so bad, but that's those are pros and cons. Yeah. Um, it's the second question. What are the best ways to get tax breaks and how does depreciation on real estate work for your income and taxes? So the tax breaks, whether you're an LLC or not, it's the same. So don't work, don't think an LLC is going to increase your tax breaks. So essentially it's, it's pretty simple. It's rental income minus rental deductions is your profit, but then you also subtract depreciation and depreciation is the, the building part of your condo divided by 27 and a half years. So if it's, if it's 500,000, and let's just say the land part's 100,000, just to make up a number, 400,000 divided by 27 is probably 15, 16,000 a year. That's an extra deduction that you get. So you may be able to minimize your taxes from this income. Right. Um, it's just an, um, another, I guess, expense. It's, it's treated as an expense. And what that does, though, is that reduces just your the cost profit. basis, right? Reduces your current profit, but reduces the cost basis so that when you sell the property, you'll have a higher gain because you've been taking a piece of that value each year. Well, then you have to pay depreciation recapture as well you when do. you sell it. You do. So you got to recapture it. So yeah. you get a tax break today, now, but then you have to recapture the tax break that you get in the future yeah. when you sell it. Unless you do a 1031 exchange or you die. Those, those are two ways out. Um, he's got a little bit more. He goes, here's my numbers. I have one pre-approved 30-year 5% mortgage that equals $3,000 a month. Realtor said the rental income averages between fifty five dollars and $65,000 a year. Uh, mortgage, including PI, is twenty one hundred. Taxes three um, hundred. HOA six hundred equals thirty one hundred bucks a month. So he's like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna get uh, thirty one hundred dollars a month, um, or or my cost is thirty one hundred, and I'm gonna get a little bit more than that. Yeah. So let's just say sixty thousand a year of income and and expenses are. In this example, about 40, 40. let's just say 20,000 to profit. Now that doesn't include maintenance and fix up and vacancy. And I, I'm guessing that with this amount of income for this price, it's, it's, he's probably doing Airbnb or, or VRBO, which requires a lot of time and effort. So if that's what you're doing, do you really want to do that? Maybe you do. I actually do that with our condo in Hawaii and I enjoy it. But anyway, it's, it's a bit of work. Yeah, I do that with um, my condo put, in the desert, but yes. I hire someone to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I do not enjoy that. You don't enjoy it? No, and I'm gladly pay someone to <laughs> do that crap. Um, right. So, but it's oceanfront. I don't know. Yeah. So, sounds pretty good. I mean, on paper, everything sounds really good until so, you buy the property and then everything right. else blows up, right? Right. So, oceanfront in Florida. Hurricanes? Do they have those out there sometimes? <laughs> Just be yeah. careful. No, he so, also asks whether he can stay in the twelve percent bracket. Well, sure. I mean, he doesn't yeah, have much income. Twenty thousand dollars is based it, with his income, and he's going to have um, standard deduction. He's also got depreciation that's going to write off some of that twenty thousand, or it could even be less than that. Yeah. And if there's vacancies and there's more expenses and there's everything else, it could wipe out 100% of the income. So um, right. a, a lot of real estate income is sheltered through all of that. So yeah, ex on... through expenses and depreciation right. is, is, is accurate. So, so yeah, based upon what we know, yeah, he could very potentially be in the 12% bracket as a, as a married couple. That would be roughly, call it 105000 of income, roughly before the standard deduction to stay in that 12%. So yeah, all right. Well, good luck with that. Hopefully, um, come and visit me up down in Florida, a little ocean front. If you missed Big Al's webinar last month on alternative retirement income sources, real estate, and beyond, click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app to go to the show notes. There you can watch the replay and download 10 tips for real estate investors and our brand new 2022 tax planning guide. For more personalized one-on-one -on -one help, click get an assessment in the podcast show notes and schedule a free financial assessment. One of the experienced financial professionals on Joe and Big Al's team 
of Pure Financial Advisors will analyze your specific situation, your retirement needs and goals, your tax liability, your ability to tolerate risk, and they'll help you develop a comprehensive financial plan that reduces your taxes and makes the most of your retirement. Click that link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes, then click Get an Assessment. Hey, I listen to Your Money or Wealth while doing laundry. Um, chooses Mick Ultra occasionally. I live in Palm Desert. Any financial or tax considerations if we decide to turn our Palm Desert condo into a rental property? It's currently our primary residence. So Bill writes in there, Big Al. So let's say I have a rental and I want to convert it to a, or it's residence. a primary. Right. Then I'm converting to a rental. Uh, this was a... a popular strategy that people would try to avoid the capital gains tax sure. and saying, Hey, I have a rental property. Now I'm going to live in it. And then I'm going to sell it and take the 121 tax exclusion and so on and so forth. So, right. What, so um, yeah. So let, let's explain that. So if, if you sell your primary residence and if you lived in it two out of the last five years, you have to own it and live in it two out of the last five years. Then you get a $250,000 gain exclusion, which is $500,000 gain exclusion if you're married. So if you convert this property into a rental property, you basically have three years to have it be a rental because then at that point, you're going to need to sell it. If in fact, you are wanting to sell it to get that $250,000 or $500,000 exclusion. So that's, that's a huge consideration there. But you're, what you were alluding to, Joe, is, is some people actually, if the gain was big enough, they converted to a rental, they sold it within that five-year period, and they took some of their gain off the table, $500,000 worth if they're married, and that was tax-free because of the exclusion. And then all the rest of the gain, they deferred into another rental as, as a 1031 exchange. And it's not commonly known, but you can do both of those rules with a single property. That's a really clever rule. If you have a property with a big gain, you don't want to pay the tax currently. You want, and you want to buy another property, you defer part of the gain into the other rental and take some off the table, just in terms of the, the, the exclusion on the principal residence. Yeah, I guess, Bill, um, you know, there's a lot of different, I guess, ideas and strategies in regards to, you know, Depends on what your goals are, again, right? But if it's your primary residence now, you're, you're going to convert it to a, a condo and you want to sell it in a couple of years and get some rents, you could still take advantage of the 121 exclusion. Um, if you're going to just convert it into a condo and rent it out for the next 20 years. Um, then, then you lose that exclusion. Th well, even though it started out as a primary? Yes, unless you move back into it. Which you oh, could. Yes, the, you, he, yes, yes. yes. That's yeah. Right. In 20 years from now, you got to move back into it and then own it for own and live in it for another two years. So that's possible. You still have depreciation recapture on the on the period of, of your rental. Right. But but that does work. If it was a residence first and you convert it to a principal residence, the rules are totally different. It's a there, there's there's a pro rata amount of well no what you said didn't make sense you said if it was a principal residence that was converted to a principal residence oh if it was sorry if it was a rental property first that was converted to a principal residence then that two out of five years it can still work but it's but it's a prorated benefit it's not the entire benefit right and that's based on some rule changes back in like 2009 yeah. or something yeah so, all right. Well, yeah, you would still get some of the, the 121 exclusion, but not all. Right. All right. Uh, got a question here on a Heckam, Alan. Okay. I would love to hear what you think about taking out an FHA Heckam. Remember that good old Wade Fowl talking about yeah. Heckams? He kind of resurrected that whole concept. Yes. Um, it's basically a reverse mortgage. Right. Home equity conversion mortgage. Uh, to be exact, I believe is what that stands for. I think so. At the beginning of retirement at 62, to help insure for health care and longevity risk, see Wade Fowle, Wade Fowle's articles. There you go. We had Wade Fowle on our show. We did. A couple of times. <laughs> yes, we did. Uh, very smart individual. Yeah, super smart. Um, instead of doing it much later as a last resort when money runs out or spending a lot, all right, so I, I guess I get the gist of his question is, yes, I, I, I think it makes sense. I mean, I don't know. Well, they don't think there's costs involved. Yeah, right? but I mean, 
and and the see the, these loans you can there's there's different flavors you can have it just be a line of credit and just draw on it if you need it and so it's there so that's one way and to that go. line of credit increases each year as you age that's right so at age 62 you take out this line of credit right there's costs associated with taking out the line of credit but then the line of credit grows at a certain rate depending on where the you know the heck of market is or the reverse mortgage right. mar market is right? right so each year so you take this thing out at age 62 and then you know at 65 let's say your your home equity um, conversion mortgage is 300,000 at 62 right and then at 65 it could be 350,000 at age 70 it could be 400,000 right and so it's just a, still a line of credit that you'll never ever have to pay back um you know if you pass someone will pay the money but yeah. you don't necessarily have to because it's a, basically a reverse mortgage yeah well you will have to pay it back if you sell your home correct or if you go to a nursing home or something like that you gotta do it then but i like that strategy i'm like so many far i mean i'm like 30 years from that age so <laughs> 30 really how's your math there buddy <laughs> 62 but it's like 40 years from now <laughs> i will have to make that decision you're, um, you're 12 but um yeah i like it I, i'm we had Wade on um he, yeah. he talked about the pros and cons of that uh, that was a few years yeah. ago yeah one of the reasons why Wade likes it is because of the sequence of no returns return risk, risk yeah. which basically means that the market may go down while you're trying to create a retirement income because you've already retired from your assets yeah. and what he said is you know what the market goes down don't pull money out of your account because it'll be hard for it to recover pull some money out of the this this um, reverse mortgage line of credit right and so if you do that then you keep your um you, you, you keep your portfolio intact that i think that there were other things too i mean he talked about using money to pay taxes on roth conversions and things like that so yeah i don't think it's a bad idea either um but there's cost to do that so just be aware yeah it depends on your liquidity if if you have other cash or depending on how much you spend and what your investment portfolio looks like you yeah. might not need it um others probably it might make sense to at least take a look at it yeah and you can always get it later too if you didn't get it now sure need a spitball of your real estate strategy your taxes or your retirement plan we want to feature you here on your money your wealth Send in your situation, your money questions, your comments, or your stories. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app to go to the show notes. Then click Ask Joe and Big Al on air and send those questions, comments, and stories in as an email or a priority voice message. And Joe and Big Al will answer you right here on YMYW. Tell your friends to listen. While you're there in the podcast show notes, don't forget to watch video of Joe and Big Al answering your podcast questions. Subscribe to the YMYW newsletter and read the transcript of today's episode. Um, here's a question for you, Big Al. We have a situation uh, where my wife's mother and her mother's two siblings inherited a property in Chula Vista. That's um, South San Diego for those of you that are keeping score. Uh, no outstanding mortgages on the $1.5 million property. Uh, trust is through Union Bank. All right. It's a little third-party trustee. Sure. Uh, when my wife's mom passed about 11 years ago, my wife and her two siblings started to receive monthly income. Uh, $1,500 rental, uh, $500 each. The other family members in her mom's family wanted to continue on with this property, but my wife and her two siblings wanted to be cashed out. All right. So we have how many total people here? Uh, I think I, as I read this, mom had two siblings, that, so they each got a third. And now when mom passed away, that went to... Uh, the his they, wife and her two siblings. Well, it, it went to the mom's kids, maybe. Yeah, like the uh, three kids. I I think that's what this is saying. So mom was getting fifteen hundred. My yeah. wife and her two siblings started receiving yeah. mom's fifteen hundred dollar yeah. rental, and they split it a third, uh, five hundred dollars each. Right. Okay. And so her mother's two siblings inherited a property. Got it. Mom died. So mom, other, mom had two siblings and then mom died and went to, her share went to her three kids. Yes. Okay. Makes sense. I almost have to diagram this. I know. 
there are many reasons why, but mostly we are at retirement age and want to cash out for personal choices. Uh, and also, we have never had a relationship with that side of the family. Uh, they're out of state. Yeah. In never, quotes. never see them. Yeah. We don't really care for that side <laughs> of the family. It's that side, <laughs> not the good side. And we're not going out there to visit them. <laughs> oh, they're on that side? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, we don't want our daughters to have to worry about how to handle all of this down the road with many, many cousins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if many, many. So right. it's, it's definitely this on could that be. side. Yeah, right. Is there anything uh, you would suggest we do to make this happen smoothly and hopefully inexpensively? Interested in your opinion on this. My wife and her siblings were recently told they could have cashed out when their mom passed, but we were not giving that option from the trust controller. Uh, best regards. So, okay, this is kind of an interesting situation where right. they, they inherited some cash that's in a trust that's managed by a third party. They have other people that are beneficiaries of the trust that are on that side of the family. Right. Where they don't want to be a part of anymore. Um, how do they get the hell out of this thing? Well, they inherited property, not cash. Right? Well, they're getting cash they're getting from cash. the inherited property Correct. that's in a trust Correct. managed by a third-party trustee, which is that, that's right. Bank. And so they would prefer just to get cashed out of their property value so that they're no longer in this deal. Yes. And I and I get it. So I own a property in Hawaii that's a leasehold, which means I don't own the land. And so it's a it's a trust that I pay the the monthly the land lease payment. And I think, as I understand, the trust, which was originally descendants of the original missionaries, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of owners in the trust. And, and so in a case like that, in, in a case like this, I think it, it boils down to what the trustee decides, right? I, I think you go to the trust document and you see what are your rights as a beneficiary? Can you, you know, are they required to buy you out if you request or 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 not, right? Another thing is just ask them, would, would you be willing to cash me out? Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. It depends if they have the financial wherewithal to do that. And if they don't, maybe they would pay you do it on a, on a note, right? Which maybe it's the same as payments. So that doesn't really do anything. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, the first step is to go to Union Bank and talk to the third party trustee. Yeah, talk to the trustee, find out what your rights are as a beneficiary. Can can you cash out? Yeah. Say we we want to simplify our lives. This has been great. We're really grateful for the you know, the cash flow, but yeah. Um we have other financial goals um that we would like to get yeah. more capital. And and if if you're not allowed to cash out, then, then you go to your well, the, you, you go to the other beneficiaries. Yeah, then you say, talk to your the, that side. You, then you're going to have to talk to that, that side. side. You might have to go visit them. <laughs> you might have to, <laughs> and then see all those crazy cousins, right? Um, and just say, hey, listen, we would like to cash out. Are, um, are you interested? Are you interested in purchasing this? Right. Um, maybe, so then maybe, we maybe they get, are. Maybe they are. Maybe we could get the cash, and then you get the full cash flow, and we're out, and we'll make life really simple and easy. Right. Um. So, but yeah, I think those are your options. And maybe if there if there was an opportunity for for you to cash out, maybe there would be an opportunity for your kids to cash out if you can't do it. I think if that's your concern is you don't want the kids that end up owning this property with 20 other people. And I get that. It gets kind of complicated after a while. Yeah. Maybe they can cash out. That that's why you have to go to the trust and find out what your rights are as a beneficiary. I wonder if the trust goes into perpetuity, you know. Isn't there a on limit on trust? No, it depends on how it's drafted. 99 years or something. And we're not attorneys, so we don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, I no all, all I know is check with the trustee, get a copy of the trust, find out what your rights are as a beneficiary. I'd start there. Um, okay, we got another one. As a general rule, what dollar amount should a couple have before they consider self-funding long-term care? Is, a, I don't, is there a general rule? No. Long-term care is super expensive. Right. So- a million dollars. <laughs> um, gosh. Yeah, that, that's a hard one to answer because every case is different. Right. And every type of care is going to be different depending on what happens. But 
I mean, um, I mean, it's funny. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that this is a relatively common statement? What I'm going to make is the people that can afford long-term care insurance actually have enough income and money to not have to pay for the insurance. Sure. Right. I mean, it, it's insurance, right? So some, because it's, it's expensive. Yeah. It still makes sense to look at it here too, because it's leverage. So maybe you spend over your lifetime, $70,000 in premiums, and then you get a $300,000 tax-free benefit to pay for care that, yeah. you know, if, if, if you needed if you, it. If you need it. If you just, don't need it. it just you, like any insurance, yeah, right? That's, right. The, that's the whole point. But, but I guess it's important for people to know that long-term care insurance is not an unlimited benefit. So a certain payment that you make each month for X number of years gives you a pool of money that you have to use it for long-term care. Right. You could select a hundred dollars a day benefit, $200 a day benefit, 250, $300 a day. I mean, you can right. kind of pick and choose because the longer the benefit or the, the deeper pockets of benefit that you get, of course, that premium is going to go pretty high. Right. Um, so I, I think you look at a plan to say, a, if something were to happen to me and my spouse or my spouse and I, what, what's the next steps? Where's the money going to come from? Right. Who's going to take care of who, right? Is, are you going to have, um, is one person going to be the caregiver? Well, th that's pretty tough to do, right? If the, 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 one of the spouse, let's say the husband goes down, right? And then you look at the, you know, the female spouse, is that, I mean, that's not really fair to her. Right. Right. Sure. Um, so there's there's got to be quality of life on both sides here. So you don't necessarily look at purchasing long-term care insurance for yourself. You kind of look at it as purchasing it for your spouse. Right. So I, I think another way we like to say this is, is everyone should have a long-term care plan. Right. right. Not everyone needs long-term care insurance. And in fact, it is quite expensive. So um, I know that's not a great answer, James, um, but I appreciate the question. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 and schedule your free financial assessment at a date and time convenient for you, no matter where you are in the country. Chances are one of the experienced financial professionals at Pure will be able to identify strategies to help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision.